The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. 1. You will hear three conversations. The first and the third between two students, and the second between a student and a clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, it's Mike, isn't it? Yes, and you're... Phoebe. Phoebe, right. Where are you headed? I'm looking for the main hall. So am I. Are you going there to register for next year? Yes. I was told to go to administrations and fill in an application form. That's what I'm about to do. I went to information and they told me it was at the end of this corridor. Then we have to turn left and immediately right. That should lead us to the exit, where opposite we should find the entrance to ground level main hall. It's a big old red building. From there we need to go to the first level and then follow the signs. Apparently it's the second office opposite the foyer. It would be pretty hard to miss. That sounds easy. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Well, since we're both heading in that direction, let's go together. Hopefully it won't take too long. I haven't had anything to eat and I'm starving. Me too. Well, how about I go to the canteen and get us something while you make your way to the main hall? I'm sure there's going to be quite a wait. There always is. I can meet you there. Sounds like a good plan. What do you want me to get you? Um, how about a chicken and salad roll and a drink? OK. What if they don't have a chicken and salad roll? Anything similar, like ham and salad, or just plain salad and cheese. Oh, and don't forget the drink. I feel so dehydrated. No problem. What type of drink? I don't know. Um... How about a Coke? No, nothing like that. Something healthier. An orange juice? They're usually full of sugar unless you get it freshly squeezed. Water? Yes, that's perfect. Here, take two pounds. That should cover it. If it's more, I'll give it to you when you get back. I only have a 20, and you know that they get cranky if you give them large notes. OK. See you in five minutes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. First year economics. I just have to fill out this form for our records. What's your name? Phoebe Payne. Can you spell that for me? Sure. P-H-O-E-B-E-P-A-Y-N-E. -E. Your address? 6 Wainwright Avenue. That's W A I N R I G H T Nottingham. Nottingham. And your phone number? It's not connected yet. I've just moved in. OK. When you get your phone connected, contact us. I'll just make a note that your phone number is to be advised. I'll do that. What course were you doing? Law? No. Economics. First year. First year economics. Yes, that's right. OK. Take this card across to the economics department and get it stamped. And then you need to come back here to pay your fees. I've made an arrangement to pay in instalments. Do you have any documentation verifying that? Yes, I have a statement from administration. 
OK, when you return, we'll have a look at it. Thank you very much. Here you are. It was quicker than I thought, but I have to get this card stamped and return here to organise my fees. That's good. It means that I won't have to wait long either. How did you get on? What with? Oh, the food. Well, there wasn't much left, so I got you a cheese and tomato sandwich and water. That's fine. Do I owe you any more? No. I need to give you back three pounds. But I only gave you two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you gave me a fiver. OK, so we're square. So what do I have to do? Go to the desk and give your personal details. Then they'll give you a card that you need to take to your faculty. What's your major? Environmental science. OK, so you'll have to take the card to the environmental science faculty and get the card stamped, return to administration in the main hall and organise your fees. And that's it? Yes, that means you're registered. Then we receive a letter with the details of our course where we'll be informed to go to the notice board or online to find out when and where our lectures are. OK. Let's have this bite to eat first. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center. And she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance, and make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. 
most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that, again, show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become you'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi Penny, Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well, actually, no, hardly ever. Especially since I've started working on my thesis. I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it, it's a competition run by Public TV. It involves my two great loves, travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? I have heard of it. Fantastic! So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? Thirteen are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then, the eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible! What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks you have to send in a ten-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps. But you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country often where you can't speak the language to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world. What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So what made you want to apply? When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought, this is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. 
So we might be watching you on television in the next few months. I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for. Course, camera, flights, accommodation and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the following talk between two friends and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called... Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, wait a minute, I've got it here, page 28. A cable car to the heavens. Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books. It's not science fiction. It's a fact. Hang on, I'll read you what he says. The space writer Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communications satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which, he admitted, is so outrageous that many of you may consider it not even science fiction, but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable. 23,000 miles long? How long? 23,000 miles. Do listen. One end of a cable 23,000 miles long would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So? The cable would be absolutely tight between the two points and the elevator would travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder if it would be more comfortable. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, and heaven knows what speed it would be travelling at. Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground. And if that happened, it wouldn't fall down. It would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it would. Yes. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway, it wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end. 
it would remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to 15,000 miles because the bit attached to the Earth would... What does he say? Oh, yes. Collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash? You know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway, even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. But I thought you said the cable would be 23,000 miles long. I did, but the 3,000-mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground, thank you very much. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.